I'm Mark Skinner. I'm from the United States. Uh, I live with severe hemophilia. Uh, I, um, I began my sort of involvement, my advocacy uh, in the, in the mid-1980s when I was trying to achieve access for hemophilia patients for a state program where I grew up in Kansas. Thank you very much for the invitation. It really is a pleasure to have a chance to come and talk to uh, people that I feel like are, are part of the family. You may be wondering why there's a talk about hemophilia in the middle of your Congress, and, and hopefully by the end of my talk you will realize that uh, we actually have a lot in common and uh, we can learn from each other. So just a little bit, a quick word or two about hemophilia. I want to introduce myself and my life so we uh, uh, can realize we actually have a sort of a shared and common experience. So hemophilia is a, a rare genetic disease. The incidence of hemophilia is about one in 10,000. Uh, it is a deficiency of a clotting factor protein, deficiency of a protein similar to you, where my blood does not clot properly. So the, the biggest and most devastating problems are, are manifestations of internal bleeding, uh, and bleeding into joints and muscles uh, that end up in severe uh, or significant morbidity and early mortality. Uh, at the time I was born, my life expectancy was somewhere in the mid-20s, uh, and today, with the advances of modern medicine, uh, is near normal. So the state-of-the-art treatment uh, is a prophylactic regimen of replacement therapy. Uh, that, of course, is arduous. Uh, I do an IV infusion every other day, uh, and it involves a, a comprehensive care team of healthcare professionals working in an integrated model uh, to actually uh, allow me to stand before you here today. So hemophilia, back, uh, this is actually in 1953, the Saturday Evening Post, uh, uh, the largest uh, publications in the United States, published this article that hemophilia was the lonesomest disease. Later in life, uh, things started to improve once we developed prophylactic therapy. I, I'm here chief of staff for the speaker of the Kansas legislature. I'm in law school. Uh, you can sort of see it in the picture. I'm, uh, I've got a crutch under my arm. I'm walking with, uh, with crutches at this point. And I had access to home treatment at that point. Uh, but as most of you uh, may know, the, um, uh, the treatment that actually brought us freedom uh, also had a huge devastation on the hemophilia community. I'll come back to this in a little bit. Uh, but I did acquire HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and sort of the list goes on. All of the viral infections, um, fortunately, uh, I, I was successful in my fourth attempt uh, to cure hepatitis C about two years ago, uh, and have now uh, checked that off the list. Um, this is what was happening with the life expectancy. As I said, you know, when I was born in 1960, my life expectancy wasn't that great. Um, by the time I got to the 1970s and had home treatment, I was near normal, and then boom. Um, 10,000 of us out of the 14,000 in the U.S. with hemophilia contracted HIV. If you looked at the now the, the nearer-term numbers, uh, there's only about 1,500 of us left living. I'm fortunate to be among that number. Uh, but uh, it really was uh, an eye-opener for us in the U.S. and the other countries that were equally devastated that we have to organize together and that we as patients really need to be at the table when we're making decisions about what treatment products are going to be available to us. Uh, we thought it was all over. Uh, you know, the big scare a few years ago, those of you that are from the UK or Ireland and, or France been through this, uh, variant CJD was, was the next sort of wake-up call uh, when we found that uh, uh, variant CJD, the human form of mad cow disease, uh, uh, variant Kreisfeld-Jakob disease, uh, was actually transmittable um, uh, in blood and uh, uh, showed up in the splenetic tissue of at least uh, one individual with hemophilia, that uh, we can't take our eye off the ball. We can't stop being vigilant uh, about blood safety and product safety. Uh, and at about the same time that VCJD was on the horizon, uh, this publication in Transfusion identified 68 pathogens uh, that were believed to be um, uh, potentially threatening uh, the blood supply or transfusion medicine. Just a whole host of things. And at the time, it was CJD, Babesia, uh, dengue fever coming up to the U.S. from Latin America. Uh, and, uh, and concerns that we hadn't even thought about at the time now have moved on to the list. So here, if you just look at this uh, sort of timeline of history of uh, emerging pathogens, the, um, uh, the green bar is HIV. You can see its diminishing impact. Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, the things that we were fighting in the 80s and 90s. But look at that long list and what is potentially an accelerating list of new pathogens that potentially impact the blood supply and at least require or merit us as a plasma-deficient or dependent community uh, 
to check them out. The last one is Zika virus. So um, uh, certainly uh, Zika is the global hot topic right now. Uh, Zika is blood transmissible. Fortunately, um, um, it is inactivated in, in plasma derivatives. But we don't know with each new virus, each new pathogen, as a patient community, we need to figure it out. We need to work with our experts. We need to rely on them. And whether there needs to be a new test or a new step. So I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm not saying this to say that you should be afraid of the therapies that you have because it's far from that. Uh, we view the plasma derivatives today uh, as equally safe uh, as our recombinant uh, analogs. But we want to check it out each time something new comes onto the horizon. Um, so anyway, in conclusion, all I wanted to say is, uh, you know, there is, there is a global reality that is shared among our communities um, that the opportunity for patient engagement was never richer, uh, but to have that impact, it requires early planning, early engagement uh, with your corporate partners, with the developers. You have a right, demand to be at the table, demand to tell them the outcomes that matter to you uh, and make a difference. Uh, and in the end, uh, I think we'll all be better off. And, um, uh, and I was going to quote Arthur Clarke at the end, who wrote 2001 Space Odyssey, if the impossible seems difficult, um, you just have to keep pushing forward because what's impossible is in fact uh, possible. I'm paraphrasing. Thank you.